Yeah, so we get in with the cops and what we found was we gave them basic skills in handling people because we know in our industry that if you're not empowered to handle problems, they typically escalate, right? And empowerment doesn't mean just making the decision. Empowerment could mean, you know, getting the person to make, you know, to the person who makes the right decision for them. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of I Know This Guy, the podcast where we dive deep into the lives of some of the most interesting people I know. Before we get started, please like and subscribe to I Know This Guy wherever you get your podcasts. By the way, my kids want me to say something about ringing a bell. What the hell's a bell? Dad, who do you have lined up for the show today? All right. Well, coming from Joe Pistone and Leo Rossi, it's John Moser, and he is heavyweight, like a real heavyweight in the hospitality industry. Wow. Yeah. I mean, just doing some research into what he does, like he literally covers like every industry. Everything. From speaking at the White House to being involved with from boys to men to, I mean, we're going to have a great talk. You know, Hayden, what's really interesting, like just before I got onto the podcast today, I was thinking about, you know, the the thread is starting at Isabella Hamilton, going over to Matthew Shedd. Matthew went over to Larry Broughton, Larry Broughton to Anthony Mel Curie. Anthony introduced us to Joe Pistone and Leo Rossi. And now we've got John on. I mean, it's just incredible. All walks of life, completely different. We would never have got to know them. And guess what? It's the show's about interesting people. I mean, that's it. You know, their struggles, their successes, and everything in between. And it's just really cool to be part of these people's lives. Yeah. Or, I mean, even to document, you know, these, these stories that probably go unheard, you know, yeah. for the most part, just to kind of like peek into each, each person's perspective and really capture it. Like, especially as it grows, it's, it's interesting to see, like, how far that spreads and all the little parts of history that <laughs> we're touching. <laughs> all right. So let's get into it. Let's do it. All right. All right, John. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Leo and Joe said that you were the most interesting guy. Now, if Leo and Joe say that you're one of the most interesting guys they know, I am not going to question that. <laughs> yeah very that's a what a what a great salutation from those two i tell you leo they are and they're the best they are those those guys are the best those guys are characters man <laughs> you know and talk about the perfect podcast you know the yin and the yang yeah and i love leo i don't know how much of of the podcast you have listened to but Leo loves doing the narrative piece, obviously. And Joe, you know, he loves he loves giving that information, which, you know, it, in his mind is, he's, I'll tell you, gloves off. He's super respectful. He treats those guys like they had a job and he treats himself like he has a job. He has no problem telling you, you know, his accomplishments and, you know, as we were talking about just earlier, getting those two in a room and having them chat, it was it was like hearing birds sing. And I, for years, listened to them and watched them. And I just thought, wow, it would be a great opportunity to put them two together. And yeah. we were able to do it. And they uh, pulled their weight. They flew in uh, because I had, uh, I had some usage of a studio in Philadelphia. And I'm a radio guy, so... I didn't really understand the dynamics of the storytelling as much. Mm -hmm. And my intros were a lot br brassier and loud. And I came in like a radio commercial and I came out like a radio commercial. But what I was able to do with the help of a really good board guy is get some really decent dialogue between these two. And man, if you don't feel like you're in the room, 
with them, you're not catching the vibe. But their episodes are, I've, I'm listening to them sporadic. I'm, I'm now listening to the one about the wise guy at Christmas time. So I want to, I'm curious to know the topics, just how the stories all apply is just awesome. Yeah, they, they are great podcasts, but I want to know a bit about your backstory. You know, really, I, I want to know, you know, what makes John, John? Yeah, well, what makes John John is probably, I would think, my overall aptitude as it relates to pleasing people, right? Mm-hmm. And and we love, I love, I love solving problems, and I love helping people. And you know, I think if you're that type of person, you could apply that to any trade, right? And you know, what we were able, what I was able to do. I'm blessed I was able to spend, you know, the, all of my working career in the hospitality industry. And throughout years of doing it, I was able to make relationships and meet people from all spectrums and get a whole bunch of experience, screw a whole bunch of stuff up, <laughs> learn, and just kind of keep going. I think the love for work and my willingness to be helpful and everyone that works with me has that, the, those, two, you know, a couple core values, but they're definitely, you know, helpfulness is definitely one of them way out of it out. Right. Helpful and hustle and you have to hustle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. So we worked on a lot of projects and I got involved with a hotel project and we spent years basically building a hotel portfolio. And, you know, one of the things that I always needed as an operator was I always said to myself, I can't bring on a salesperson and rightfully for the entire year and, you know, spend a lot of time training that person and not have any return on my investment. Right. And you know, and I could exp- I could say that for almost all the areas of project management as it related to hospitality. So what I always thought would be great is having like a hospitality SWAT team and, you know, pick your poison, pick your problem. And, you know, we put a group of individuals that can act and respond very quickly that work in a dynamic together. So we were able to kind of you know, basically out of a need of something that I wanted to need it as an operator, we created a business of professionals that are in the hospitality industry, the best of the best, as far as I'm concerned. And we have an incredible resume. We serve, we service the best of the best. There's not one client that isn't been on Food Network or appeared several times or is on the verge of breaking. We're very very lucky and thankful to have the ability to be with some of these incredibly long-standing goodwilled companies and be part of their adventure of expansion. So how did you get into that? I mean, the, the first thought was, you know, how do I create a SWAT team, right? How do I fund the SWAT team? And then how do I find clients? So, you know, Obviously, I put the team together, right? And you know, there's that balancing act, right? And we, obviously, I was a, I am a saver. I've always been a saver, so I had the ability to kind of give that a shot. And I had a very good reputation in the hotel industry. I was just coming off of a couple big awards that I won in the hotel industry. I won an operators award in the Wyndham brand for the whole brand. I won another award for developing. Um, a developer of the year award. I was networked extremely well in the hospitality program in the hotel world. And, but I came from a food and beverage background. So now I'm kind of loaded for bear and I want to create this SWAT team and it just kind of fell in place. And I started with, you know, a couple smaller jobs. And then I connected with Tony Luke, who is part of the Philadelphia cheesesteak royalty. There's a, Pat's, Gino's, and Tony Luke's considered the big three there of cheesesteaks. And I connected with him and we hit it off really well. And we were able to really, really expand the brand in a very short amount of time. 
And, you know, we had a reputation of, of getting things done that we said we were going to get done. We set our expectations level right with our clients. So we were always meeting their expectations, if not exceeding them, and started with that job. And it just it kind of snowballed from there. We have now we have we have probably over a hundred clients. We probably have, I would say, thirty of them that are that use us on a very frequent basis, and probably about a half a dozen clients that use us full time. So when I say full time, we're running in a capacity of either we're operating the store all the way down to that level, or we are representing a franchise. We sit on both ends. For one client, we represent their franchise business of 17 stores. For another client, we represent their interest in a franchise business called Sonic Burger, which if I'm sure if you have them. I they're Unfortunately, they're not in Canada, but when I visit the States, I visit them very often. <laughs> right. So we're able to, we have a unique perspective. We work both ends and we, we now it's, now this is, I've, I've told you that now we're now today is 12 or 13 years later. And and we have those same teams now, and now it's not one team. Now it's three teams, and our approach is basically the same, the same direction. We work in you know the day to day operations, if you want, and then we work in development of branding and developing, whether it be franchise development or just you know growth planning for legacy brands, and and then we work with projects, you know, project-based, like train, you know, 500 cocktail waitresses, how to upsell. Oh. Uh, you know, it seems very insignificant, but when the waitress or the cocktail waitress is now going to you and saying, when you order a vodka tonic, and then they're saying to you, would you like absolute? And they're shaking their head in a positive manner, just like you were shaking your head just mm-hmm. there. You caught me. I'll take one. There we go. And now you, you've just entered the world, world of call liquor. I called a brand, right? I called mm-hmm. a specific brand. So you're looking at, you know, a 30, 40% margin increase. Just by shaking my head. That's how, that's how McDonald's gets me on fries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They'll get you. Yeah. And McDonald's, they, they get you every way coming because they work the strategy of small, medium, large. And the, the difference is, minimal between between the sizing it's in the packaging obviously from a small to a large there's a variance mm-hmm. but the pricing index doesn't match the cost of goods right so you're you're hitting the full spectrum when you're going into a hotel or into an environment like just so i understand correctly hospitality industry hotels and franchise like restaurants like you were talking about with sonic is that correct yeah, food and beverage yep, falls under hospitality is a large group. It's you know your event planners, your mm-hmm. venue planners, your restaurant tours, concession business going into, and then they're all broken into categories. So you have entertainment, you have higher education. All of those different avenues are handled differently under hospitality, food and beverage, and or you know whatever the client whatever the client needs are and that the needs under hospitality could run from how student housing all the way down to POS system that accrues for your dining card. Okay. So, and I know this isn't typically a business podcast, but I am, I'm really interested. How do you handle that diversity? And I mean, you're talking about training, you know, cocktail waitresses, 500 of them at the time, but you're also running the systems over at Sonic. How do you do that? How do you, how do you create processes and procedures on that scale for people to follow? I mean, that, that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, you know, I never look at it that way. (laughs) I look at it more from a a perspective and I think this will help you under, help you 
understand how we can absorb it so quickly. Mm -hmm. They already have the rules and procedures and policies in place. All right. They, they, they're there. Are they to the level of what the action is that they want? Not necessarily, uh, but are there standards already there? Yeah, they're already there. So that really helps us. So when I take over a Sonic, or we're in this case, we're, we're working with a gentleman that has seven Sonics mm -hmm. and they're all located in the Delaware Valley in, in the good old U.S., Mid-Atlantic. And when we enter that, when we enter that project, the first thing we do is we download and we download two ways. Uh, one is we'll download with a specific client, right? All their procedures, all their rules and regulations. And if we, if they don't have them, then we immediately put them into place. We have standard operating procedures as it relates to running anything that's in the hospitality world. So we would put them in place. The brand, though, another individual from the team would go directly to the brand. Hi, you know, I'm David from MBB. We took over this project. I'd like to meet my brand representative. We get the brand rep on the phone. I need a brand standards manual. I need the complete download from you. And I need the last three or four quality assurance inspection reports. Uh, and then he'll fully download. Then you say, the guy that usually runs the projects is usually the guy that's handling the client, right? So now the guy that learned all about the brand and the Sonic, he's an F and B specialist, right? He will download to the project manager. Each job, each team has a, a little bit of a different mix up, but in there is a person that handles all the marketing, all the marketing advancement, all the sales advancement, they get downloaded. Most of the time, that person is working off of our system because they don't have one in place. Okay. Right. You know, and then we kind of just bring, bring them all together, set up goals. That's very important that we always set up a goal and an expectation for our client. And then we get, we get to work. All right. So I got to ask you this. Have you ever brought in Mr. Mercury? Uh, no, I have not. <laughs> you've never seen him sneak up on you in the background because one of these hotels that you've come in is just horrible? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I haven't. No, thank goodness I haven't. Right. No, Anthony and I have worked on a couple different projects with a couple brands, bigger hotel brands. And Anthony has, he would probably say, I don't have his prowess, but and he's probably correct, but he has an incredible attention to service and detail to service and gives impeccable service. Him and I have spoke numerous times about the condition of our country as it relates to service. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's funny. I, I actually have to give him a call. I have a URL that I bought for him and then I've been just paying for, her, and I know I've had it for years. I have to send it to him. It's the service revolution, mm. because at at some level, you know, Anthony feels the same way MBB does, and you know, you know, we think it's really attitude driven, right? First and primary, and then, then after that, it's you know, it's training, it's training, it's training, reward training, and you know, treating people like normal human beings and giving them proper time off, and you know, this industry is completely changing. It's in front of our eyes, this industry is changing. So outside of COVID, I mean, obviously things are changing, but what are you seeing changing? What is drastic or what's dramatically changing? Well, COVID has dramatically changed right. things that were on the uptick anyway. All right. So where you've seen Airbnb was on the uptick over Marriott prior to this, they clobbered them, right? Where you've seen... Third-party deliveries were starting to tick up. Your Uber Eats, your mm -hmm. Door Dashes, they've been set in motion. They're all up on the dial. Where you've seen people that were, were working in e-commerce, because we work with a lot of food products and they're they specialty lines, we've seen just 
exponential growth in all those categories. Prior to COVID, all those categories were all ticking up. When COVID hit, they all got a boost in the arm and they just came right over the dial. They've come so far over the dial, you know, that I think, you know, I think key industry leaders need to get together and think about what's going on, starting with the hotel industry, because, Mm -hmm. I mean, you've had some brilliant crossover work done by some of the companies like Wyndham, where they captured a lot of those timeshare properties and they've crossed the rewards systems, the loyalty systems, so that you can use your timeshare divided into room nights and stays and vice versa. You could take your room nights and stays and multiply them into a vacation resort timeshare a couple weeks in Florida or whatnot. I, I think Airbnb, I think the world went to Airbnb somehow during COVID people felt it was safer to stay in someone's house than it was in a hotel room. The business Business travel in in our country is gone right now. It does not exist. It does not exist. And I'm not so sure it's going to come back. I'm I'm positive it is not going to come back to where it was once Mm. was, business travel. There's no doubt in my mind on that one. And I think it's going to be a long way there. I used to travel two weeks out of every month and always on the road, Canada, U.S., wherever conferences were. Loved it, loved networking and talking to people. Virtual summits came in and actually they became too popular. And they were, they just, they were everywhere. And all of a sudden it cheapened because you couldn't, if you're going to an event, you could charge anywhere from a few hundred dollars to 10, 15, even $20,000, depending on what the topic was. You get nothing. Virtual summits now, you're pretty much giving away tickets. They've liquidated Maybe. the asset, right? Yeah, that's it. Pro- I don't know if it's called product cannibalization. Yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is popping up in my industry. Hospitality, some, you know, is a, entertainment is a sister to hospitality, and and you know, you know what what are they going to do? Well. We have so many options out there now. All of a sudden, now you're getting these little live virtual pop-ups as appearances from artists. Is that the new norm? Well, if you ask the artist, yeah, sure, he gets thirty or forty thousand dollars for an appearance, and he only and he only received five thousand dollars for his virtual appearance, but he just cut out, you know, weeks of tra- you know, days yeah. of traveling, hours of preparation traveling. It's hard to believe that we're going to bounce back. I, I, I think anyone that feels that business travel will bounce back completely is being completely foolish. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't see it. I, I really can't. Not. I don't think we'll get 50% back of business travel right now. I, I think there's pent up demand. I think I think this summer is going to be in the United States going to be an absolute zoo with traveling on the roads. And I think the hotels will be packed with leisure travelers Mm -hmm. and, you know, old time amusements and events will become popular again. But I just think before, before the CFO pulls the trigger on a round trip air ticket, a hotel accommodation, meals per diem, car insurance, he's really going to just kind of measure that against the Zoom call. The other thing you got to measure is the risk, risk reward. If you're traveling, and could you catch something? And I think that's going to play a bigger part in this too. So if you send out, I have a a partner in another business, and sure enough, he went to Miami, came back, he he got COVID. Well, the vaccine wasn't out at the time. He got COVID, that that hit him. When he was in the office, he caught, like one of the operations manager caught it. And it's just... Yeah, there is a risk factor when you, when you're doing it. I I hate being. I'm in Canada. I'm locked down. I want to get across the border, and now the border to get to the U.S. is even harder to get across. It used to be Canada bringing you know, coming across. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and like it's a shame. But I really just think business travel is going to be reinvented. 
I think, you know, I already see it in, de- in development of hotel rooms. Mm-hmm. They're, they're already changing drastically. Common area is going to be more equipped. You know, it's not uncommon to have a 3D printer uh, in the lobby of a hotel. You know, my company, we're working on telecommunic or not telecommunications. I, I say because it's a telephone, but basically data communication where you could place an order of food with me. Mm-hmm. You know, I recognize you, I grab everything, and then I put it in a heated locker that you go to. Now, this locker would be in the lobby of your hotel building, right? And you would park your car. And if you did everything right, and the timing was right there, when you walked in, you'd have a code and you would just scan that code to that specific locker and your food is warm and ready to go. Nice. So so these are all things that are, were, were just mere thoughts a couple of years ago that have been pushed completely to the forefront, right? Every, every, you know, I call it an exit, co- an o- a pathogen plan. We're still, believe it or not, we're still building some stuff from restaurants and what's your pathogen plan? Oh, what do you mean? Well, where's your service window for when you get shut down again, right? How, how are you going to maintain, you know, is your POS system prepared to take on these third-party deliveries? Is, are you, how are you advertising? How are you, how are you maintaining your business? And do you have the right tools to maintain your business, right? Well, I don't know, John, I, had, I did really well. Well, if you did really well with takeout, then let's step up takeout. You know, can we can we spend another point or two percentage point or two on on the vessels in which the food gets carried in? Just a completely upside down vision of if you would ask me where I thought we were, we're going to go and where we're at now. You know, obviously, I've seen uh, big venues were still in play. The experience was turning from exclusive to inclusive. Right. You were included more in Mm -hmm. whatever the production was. If it was a music production, you were included, maybe a tour through the green room or, you know, I, you know, I don't know. And that was done and that's being done and and was planning on being done, you know, access to your phone, right. Being included in the backstage production. Well, how do you include 50,000 fans on an event night, right. Into the backstage production. Oh, you know, simple. You put a camera up and you give them access to the feed on an app. Right. All of us, little tricks like that, all of a sudden now we're including people into live events, right? And these are the things and the pivoting mechanisms that have to take place right now because the gap between how people are going to, when are you going back out and getting ready to, when are you going into the mosh pit or, like when are not you, anytime soon, <laughs> you know, when are you ready to go? I mean, we're talking about this as a family right now, you know, when, when dad, when can we get on a plane? Dad, when, yeah. you know, well, yeah. you know, that when am I waiting for the immunization? Yeah. But I mean, between now and then and all everything between, between what are we doing? And what I've noticed is a lot of great companies pivoting, a lot mm-hmm. of small companies pivoting. I've noticed a lot of great, great things. And I think there's game changers are here to stay. You Either talked there. about it at the very beginning when we started the, the conversation about uh, you brought in brand and being able to take that brand. Well, with every brand, there's a culture. Behind every business, there's a culture. And if, if you can, like with the SOPs, it's not all SOP driven. But if everybody's on the same page, it could be a hotel, it could be a, a restaurant chain. But if you can ever build that corporate culture or that brand culture, I mean, it's magic what can happen. And I'm sure, I, I like to see, you must have had so many examples of that happening with what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, we could go on and on. You know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Right. You cannot... There's no Trump to culture. If you can get the culture, which is attitude driven, right? Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of applying. I, you know, I, 
we're firm believers in that. We gauge all of our culinary and all our hospitality talent, you know, under an acronym. Uh, the acronym is SAC. It's skills, attitude, confidence, and knowledge. And on a scale of one to 10, I'll take a 10 on attitude and a zero on the other three categories any day of the week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know. And then when you have the right attitude to accept the culture that you have created, because you're, you're an artist when you're creating culture, a lot of guys won't think they are right. They would be offended, you know, call Jamie Dimon an artist, he might get offended, right? But they are an artist. They do create a culture. He's not the perfect example, by the way, of a good culture. But the thought process is that you can't be culture. I've tried it. I've seen places. I've seen people come in and try to change policies, right? And you're, you know, I've seen corporate takeovers where all of a sudden the bank owns, you know, a $3 million beach bar. Right. And they're going to send in a team from Idaho and that, you know, in, in a matter of a half a year, that's it. It's over. And that goes back to, I think, the culture. Now, there's I'm not saying turn a blind blind eye either because there's morality. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Culture doesn't trump doing the right thing. But if your culture's right, you can win. And there's a million brands. I mean, we could go on talking great culture for days. Yeah. And you see it. if And there's know. horrible service out there. Incredibly. <laughs> I mean, I, we spent, no, let's see, 2019, 2018, we spent probably about a half a year working with the Philadelphia Police Department. And we worked on, they were a really smart organization, the top brass was smart. And what they said was, hey, listen, these guys are in the service industry all day long. Now, although they take different complaints and they're not the, obviously of the same importance, but here's an organization like MBB that has the ability to just about spin every complaint that you have, you can bring forward to them. Well, how about if we brought these guys out to the academy and we talked to them? Then when I say these guys, they're talking about MBB and how do we apply it? And we applied it. We were able to come up with, you know, an acronym for the police to use. It was called LAST and it was listen, acknowledge, solve, and thank. Yeah. So we get in with the cops and what we found was we gave them basic skills in handling people because we know in our industry that if you're not empowered to handle problems, they typically escalate, right? So, and empowerment doesn't mean just making the decision. Empowerment could mean, you know, getting the person to make, you know, to the person who makes the right decision for them. So we worked on basically, you know, an, an acknowledgement platform. And, you know, I'll tell you, it, you know, the Philadelphia Police Department is a 165-year-old company, okay? You want to talk about culture, there's a jumping off spot. We went into a company that had notoriously negative culture. I think just what the police stood for down to how aggressive they were. And in Philadelphia, we've had characters over the year. We've had our police commissioner become the mayor, a gentleman by the name of Frank Rizzo. And he ran things, you know, very conservatively, very straight and narrow. Streets mm -hmm. got cleaned and very old school approach. And over the years, what I've seen and working with the cops is, you know, I'm not a big believer in de-weaponizing the police. I'm a big believer in getting them the right weapons, right? Mm -hmm. And an example of that is just to have the ability, sure, you go through academy and you learn all that, but during academy, do they do, they do, the, do, they do the, 
the role playing with, you know, irate citizen number one, irate citizen number two, irate citizen number three, right? And no, the question, the answer is no, they don't do that. So, you know, it's a piece of training. You're dealing with the community. You're dealing with people. You are, in essence, employed by these people that you're dealing with, right? And how do you how do you work with that? Because very few people are bringing the police good news, right? Very, you know, it's usually bad news. I need you. There's an emergency. Mm-hmm. There's a, you know, an arrest that needs to be made. A baby needs to be delivered. That's probably the highlight of the, 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 the job in there. But not to get off on a tangent, but what I thought was cool is they took the advancement, the police, to talk about you know, how do we de-escalate situations that are just extremely normal, everyday situations? Like, excuse me, officer, do you know where the, you know, the the 21st police district is? Or do you know where the detective's headquarters are? And being able to say, instead of being, no, I don't know, and keep walking, at least take some ownership of the problem. And you know, the whole objective was to to make it, you know, a more cohesive community police department. But talking about culture again, it's hard to get it through. We we worked on it for a long time, but the culture was so embedded. And I just want the point I want to make is bad culture is not subject to just hospitality. Bad service is not subject to just hospitality. I find just even even mundane, mundane or routine items, even calling the doctor's office, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone needs some basic hospitality training, you know, and not so much emphasis. There seems to be some kind of subculture. There's an emphasis on, I just work here. I come for 40 hours, right, to work. And I didn't give this person a hard time. And now they're really giving me a hard time. They weren't my customer. They weren't my client. And, you know, I don't want anything to do with it. Well, that's bad culture, right? Right. You know, we're not asking you to solve the problem, but you do need to acknowledge the person and you do need to get them to someone in protocol that can help them. And that basic problem, go to you go to the supermarket, the grocery store in the United States of America and pay your bill and see if you say thank you to the cashier or see if the cashier says thank you to you. I guarantee you, you wind up saying thank you to the cashier. Mm -hmm. Just, we're almost trained that way anymore. You you know, good service is not getting bad service. (laughs) That's good. That's the standard for good service right now. Just not getting bad service is right. the standard. You're happy if you leave and you didn't get bad service. Right. What are we doing as people? Where is our, we have no, we take no pride in anything that we do. Yeah. And just imagine if, if you just do something that much better, I mean, not a lot better, just that much better what you can achieve. Right. And what does it yield? What does it do for your ROI? Yeah. Because I, anyone that tells you that's hogwash, they don't know their ass from their elbow. I'm telling Absolutely. you. It's yep. everything. It's everything. Yeah. It's everything. I mean, even go, I can't even believe he just passed away. Is I was amazed that he passed away. It was Tony Shea. He's the guy that uh, started Zappos. Right, right. Yeah, just a young guy. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to, don't. Don't hold me to it. I swore I read real fast that he passed away. I'm not yeah. sure. Oh, he did. Oh, he did. Okay. Yeah. So I had I had an opportunity to spend some time with him and in a, a very brief window, but very intense amount of time and amazing service culture. Mm-hmm. No bullshit. Pick up the phone and challenge anyone at Zappos, anything, and they're going to do it for you. Yeah. You know, was there, what about his shoes? I don't know. Could you even name one brand that he carried? Probably not. It didn't matter. No. He had he had the culture that was right, you know. Right. And at some level it comes down to taking pride in what you what you're doing. I think we've missed that somewhere along the line. I don't know why. In 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 any profession, 
that you don't see yourself as a long-term career position, it seems like we just, we step, we sidestep our efforts. It's like, it's not part of our scorecard. Like I'm just passing through kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's the destruction of the small, it's, it'll kill a small business. It will put a family business out of business. And I, I wish I up here in Canada, we're unfortunately, you, you know, we don't get a lot of help as a small business. And if we could have some sort of incentive package to help, you know, with, with these types, like a program to maybe just get people back into building a performance based culture, you know, I don't know what, you know, what it would take. You know, John, we, um, like, I love SOPs. So, like everything that we do, we have SOPs for. When we started this, I went through the uh, E-Myth Academy like 25 some odd years ago. And one of the things that I looked at, were there was two things. First of all, when you hire somebody because you're on the sales roller coaster and your performance is up here, but you're running 25 hours a day, so you have to hire somebody, but you don't train them properly, but you scream at them because they did it wrong. And then you take it back because nobody can get the job right until you are working 25 hours a day. And it's like a sales roller coaster. You just never get the momentum. And it's always, you know, the, the, the person that you've hired that is screwing up rather than proper training. So I love the proper training side. And the other side, this is, this is so crazy. And you'll probably roll your eyes at this, but we have a five page policy. So SOP on how to make a perfect cup of coffee. Now, the reason why we did this, we had 23 people came in. We said, okay, we're going to start this whole thing off. And everybody thought was rolling their eyes. Like, why are we doing this policy for, you know, making a cup of coffee? Well, let's see, why do we need it? And all of a sudden we're sitting there going, what do you, what do you mean? What do you need a cup of coffee for? Well, first of all, Let's say a customer comes in and sitting in our boardroom and they ask for a cup of coffee. You offer to get them a cup of coffee and it's burnt or it's not there. And now they got to wait 10 minutes to get it. Or that person who's the, you know, could be a receptionist, could be somebody in the back coming in and they're just grabbing a quick cup of coffee and it's burnt. And now they've got to put it on. It starts to add up to negativity. But beyond that, let's talk about, does everybody know where everything is? how much to order, how many scoops to put in. And all of a sudden, we ended up having this five-page cup of coffee or or, uh, uh, policy. And then it was simple. We had people reporting and making sure if there's anything that uh, happened, here's all the, you know, the systems that were in place if we had to order something. But we made a rule. First person in, we all voted on it. First person in had to put on the coffee for for the start. Well, the first person in drank tea and he, he didn't want to do it. And it's like, look, it's not that you drink tea or not drink coffee. It's the first person coming in. If you're not the first person in, it's the next person that comes in, you know, that'll make the cup of coffee. But we got to be consistent. It's about consistency. Guy, we pulled him in the office and first warning. You know, look, this is a learning experience. So look, this is the reasons why, you know, do you understand? Okay, second day. Bring them in. You didn't put, I keep going to say the guy's name. I don't want to do it. But anyways, hey, look, you know, I, what part of this you know, can we help you out with? It, this is the reasons. And it, and he just kept saying, I don't drink coffee. And I just, at the end of it, I said, look, you have a really, he had a great job. He was our sales manager. And I just went, the main reason why we're doing this is not because to get people to put on a cup of coffee. It's so they can, they can follow procedures and SOPs that are much more complicated than putting on a cup of coffee. And the third, like we always had, if the person messed up the third time, it was no longer an educational, we'd let them go. So he said, I guess it was coming on to Friday. And he said, are you serious? You'd let me go. And I said, if tomorrow you, I come in and, you know, the, there's no coffee on, you're gone. And it was like, you're not going to do this. But we had to cut in the, but after that. Did you terminate them? 
No, he came in and he, he made, made the, the coffee. Ball. Yeah. And also. It was your test. He, it was your test with this guy. And it was for everybody because everybody was waiting to see what would happen. Sure. Everyone's watching. You. That was the turning point in our company for, for culture. We're starting to build out all these policies. Yep. We had everybody that was responsible for building out their own policies because what we told them, part of the corporate uh, culture was, look, we want to give you extra time. If you can build up a cover off system, we'll get you, we'll pay you 40 hours for four days work, eight hours a day. You'll have a cover off person so you can take the Friday, Saturday, Sunday off, and then come back on Monday, you'll cover off. And we had a system down where we had people working four days, getting paid for 40 hours. Man. And they loved it. You know, so it worked really well. I applaud you for holding the line. And you know what's unique that you said I thought was cool is that you said you that was the exact moment you knew that your culture was was on its in the right direction. Right. Yeah, and, and that is true. You know, there are those moments, you know, when I know it for me personally, when I mean, especially lately, I don't know if it's because of COVID or I'm getting older and tired, but I know it when everyone's, you know, they're calling me out on the culture and, and, or they're using their core values, you know, to say, you know, not to beat you up, but this decision, you know, show it to me here on the core value card. Right. And, you know, it's right. They're right for doing it. And I Mm -hmm. think anytime you can create that environment, right. And, and it it just it eliminates the daily work, the grind. It becomes fun, right? Yeah, it's it's laid out. And the other thing I love about it, is, especially with SOPs, is that it makes it so easy to learn. Yes, you know, it's right there. It's right in front of you. Gray out. The devil lives in the gray area, right? Yeah, and he loves the gray area. The devil, and he loves the devil hates. SOPs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we say all the time. Because the devil does. He hates an SOP. It doesn't leave a well written SOP leaves nothing for interpretation. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you need them. And I I we go by them, we use them. We're big proponents on standardizations. We're, we really are, especially in we do a lot of franchise work and you know, we do value these brands. And what they've put together, really important that you you run under their business model, right? You know, with the intention, obviously, to be a solvent company and, and you know, always look favorable to your client. But, you know, I'm a firm believer if you follow all the rules, you do what you're supposed to do. It might take a little bit of time, but it'll all come together, right? And when you have that, that solid cohesiveness, you'll see real rural rural movement we've done in a we've had this sonic project for under two years and completely turned the project around we've done great things the ownership group was really awesome uh, we really we love it personally when we add value you know mm. that's our sweet spot adding value and especially we feel like it's such a, a win when you add value to already successful people. And so, I, I think that's really where I, we get a lot of our business from, you know, when you have extremely successful people in our industry saying, these guys are for real. These guys will help you. They, these guys have helped me. Right. Now, I, I got a question about people that are the core problem. So you go in there and maybe you're working with an owner or it could be, let's say it's one of the police, but it's somebody that doesn't buy in to what you're doing. So it, whether it's hotel, franchise. Doesn't matter what you, yeah, right. You always have those people. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, look, you try to address them, frankly, there, it typically is that they're afraid of something. Mm-hmm. It typically is they're insecure. Right. And, something is just not gelling with them. So, you know, we have that very frank conversation with them that says to them way off the top, look, this is not going to be a path of success for you with your current attitude. You know, we're big believers in 
pre-warning, fair warning, co totally communicate. But a lot like you did with the call fee, we have our line, we have a business to run. And guess what? This industry isn't for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. I There's a lot of days that I look at different industries and I think to myself, you know, that individual does such a thorough job that they take respect in their job, right? And they they must like what they do, right? And and I, you know, that's the big disconnect that I miss. I miss that. I don't see that. I don't see that entrepreneurial passion. And I don't even see people that take pride in even their day-to-day -day jobs as much as I believe they should. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's such a it's it's such a overused saying. But if you do something that you you know just if you love it and you want to just you know do your job and I mean the money's going to come. I feel that way too. I, listen, I've never made money the focus. I've always saved. I've always given. I've the more I give, the more I get. I know that is factual. And I think that's God's doing the, I think overall, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I live by a, a, a strict moral code and, you know, I, maybe it, my expectations are too high um, at times of the people, but, you know, I'm, I want to play up. I want to be around that have me searching and reaching and grasping and, you know, I love being challenged. And I think that all goes to personal growth. And then all of a sudden you're happy what you could do. I always, why do people go to dead end jobs? Why in the world are you in a dead end job? I don't understand. Well, they I say, don't you don't understand, John. Well, what, what don't I understand? Well, it doesn't pay. So I'm stuck. Well, then get two jobs. Well, how are you going to get two jobs? Well, you get two jobs. You work two jobs. Well, I can't work two. Well, work a job and a half. What are you trying? What's your ultimate goal here? Right? You want mm -hmm. to better yourself. You're trying to pull yourself out. Uh, and people are just always, always seem to be missing that one component, which is, mm -hmm. is me, myself. Yeah. yeah. That's a shame. But it, look, and how many vibrant people I've met that are incredible at what they do and take incredible pride in what they do. So many super vibrant professionals. So John, I also heard that you started the first African American nightclub in Philadelphia. How did that happen? I don't know if it was the first, but it was by far the largest without a doubt. Oh, very yeah. cool. So the what's the story? Five, <laughs> we would hold about 5,000 people a night. What? Yeah, it was pretty wild. Yeah. That's yeah, it was crazy. Incredible. Yeah. So the fast story is one of my mentors and the guy I came up with was uh, Frank Cassisiri. And in Philadelphia, there was a, a redevelopment zone. This is going back into the 90s. And it, what it was, was our waterfront, basically, it was just abandoned and dilapidated. And so a couple of businesses sprung up nightclub based businesses. So what we what we did was we were on an actual pier and what we were able to do was import sand from the Jersey Shore. We were able to plant it was a seasonal club. We were to plant palm trees. We put an in-ground pool in and we then kicked off it was by far the hottest nightclub on the East Coast. It was definitely not the first one that was geared all towards African American, but it was by far the largest and the biggest easily done. They had a song that's called Let Me Clear My Throat. I don't know if you ever heard it. It goes like, let me clear my throat. And then it goes into a like a brassy beat. If you heard it, it was a top hit song and it was recorded live at the nightclub. So what we were able to do was, you know, I don't know, I don't know how socially you want to get involved in this, but there, you know, what we realized was that the black community in Philadelphia didn't really have a spot down on this new nightclub row, this redeveloped nightclub row. And at that point, there was roughly about 
maybe 13 or 15 of these nightclubs. They were all large capacity nightclubs. And you had your range. It was on a dial. And I would say over half of them were just a, a Philadelphia population nightclubs, both, you know, urban, black, white, Latino, a mixing pot, right? Half of them. And then the other half were more designed for ethnicities, which uh, it's a whole nother story because Philadelphia is the most segregated city in the country by far. I could talk to you about that later, but the thought was that the black community didn't really have a night club. Right. And you know, why not? Well, for a lot of reasons, most of them were myths and stereotypes to be perfectly honest with you. And what we, we said was, well, the hell on this, let's get started. So we got started and I had, we were able to get started and we had people that would have been with us for a while at, at the other venues. And we had, I couldn't even, if I told you the people that went through the door, you wouldn't even have believed me. I can't even remember all of them. To this day, I still have people reaching out to me saying, remember when this person, we had, I mean, the classics were Biggie. We had Sean Combs. We had Mary J. Bly. We had, from the sports world, we had them all. We had Tommy the Hitman, Hagler. We had Cedric the Entertainer, Deion Sanders. And what was cool is the black community came from, from basically from Manhattan and from Washington. And it came to this totally outdoor urban black, black-based nightclub. And it was a blast. It, 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 like a lot of other nightclubs, it ran its course, but, you know, against speculation by the city and, you know, neighbors, we had a blast and we had a great time. Everyone was safe. It was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. That concludes the first half of our interview with John Moser. Make sure to tune in later in the week to hear the rest of the interview. As always, make sure to like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. That's Spotify, that's YouTube, that's Apple Podcasts. Uh, we're on and all. That's enough for me, and I'll see you next time.